Dickheads! This pink laser beam of truth is beaming to you from Germany, L.A., San Diego, to your brain hole. But we're not being dickheads today, we're being bracketeers, because we're going to be talking about the queen of the space operas, Lee Brackett, with the book The Big Jump. And the reason why we're doing this in Dick Adjacent, you can't get more Dick Adjacent than sharing the binding of his debut novel, The Solar Lottery. And that's what this novel, The Big Jump, by Lee Brackett, is. And I threatened in our very first episode, Solar Lottery, like, hey, someday I'm going to do an episode about The Big Jump. It only took me four and a half years but here we are. And um, I wanted to call on some people to talk about this with me. And I wanted somebody who's a bracketeer and an expert and somebody who may be new to Lee Brackett. I've read a lot of Lee Brackett myself. I'm a fan. So, uh, but I had never read this book before. So, Grant, tell the folks who you are, what you do. <laughs> All right. My name is Grant Womack. I'm a writer tarot reader, music manager. I do a lot of different things. have a couple books out on Amazon, Bizarro, horror, uh, crime fiction. I have a new book called God's Leftovers coming out later this year. Super excited for people to check it out. And this is the first time I've read any of Lee Brackett's work. Exactly. Now, Cora Bullard is... Somebody that I knew at some point I would call on you, Cora, because I've heard you on a lot of podcasts. Uh, specifically, uh, I think I first heard you on He Goes There with uh, with uh, the homie Seth Easley. And uh, I I also thought you did a, a fantastic job breaking down C.L. Moore's Jorel of Jewelry on the Appendix N podcast. And so, Cora, uh, tell everyone, you are quite the science fiction expert and uh, so why don't you tell the folks who you are, what you do, and how they can find you. I've also read a lot of your reviews on Galactic Journey. Well, I'm Cora Bulot. I'm from Bremen in northern Germany. And I'm a teacher, translator, and a writer. And um, I'm also a two-time Hugo finalist for Best Fan Writer in 2020 and 2021. And um, I blog at my own site, which is um, www. Corabulot.com, that's C-O-R-B-U-H-L-E-R-T. And um, I also have a couple of books on Amazon. And I also review um, review older science fiction for Galactic Journey, which is basically a typical science fiction fantasy. We talk about the magazines, the stories, the books, the movies, the science news, except that we live 55 years in the past. So it's early 1967 now. The Summer of Love will be happening this year. Well, in the U.S. and in California, unfortunately, it won't be so lovely in Germany, where the beginning of the late 60s student protests are about to turn violent, which is not such a nice thing. And um, I'm also a big fan of Lee Brackett. I've been a fan of hers um, ever since I was a teenager and read my first story by her, actually in a bookshop in Rotterdam, because um, I couldn't afford the book. English language import books were very expensive. <laughs> expensive so I just read them in, sh in the shop shop and then later I I sought out whatever I could by her and of course I've also seen not just only the Empire Strikes Back but also several of the other movies she where she worked as a screenwriter but the big jump was actually new to me because it's um, one of the more obscurely bracket titles but I'm very glad to have read it because it's a good one but then I've never had a bad one <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, yes well, and um, also I will be having a um, will be an essay by me about a Lee Brackett story called The Queer Ones, also from about the same period. I think it's from 1953. Will be out, um, out, well, maybe in a few months uh, in, a, in a collection called Rediscovery Volume 2 Science Fiction by Women 1953 to 1957. Yeah, I'm really excited for that book. I discovered Lee Brackett just like most people did as I saw her name on Empire Strikes Back and then when I was at a bookstore going through just names, I'm like, oh, wait, I know that name. I saw that on Empire Strikes Back, and I bought my first uh, Eric St. Uh, Stark book, which is like one of the space opera series that she had, and I read that when I was in seventh grade, right? And basically fell in love with her writing. 
from the beginning. However, weirdly enough, I have read big the big I hadn't read Big Jump before. Um, although it's really up my alley in a lot in a lot of ways. But before we get into this book a little bit, I want to talk about a little bit of her biography. Uh, Lee Brackett it was born and raised in L.A. She's she's a uh, uh, um, Los Angelino uh, and lived most of her life there. She had a short period where she lived where she moved with her husband to Ohio, but but ended up back there. Which is one of the reasons why it was easy for George Lucas to, to just like bring her in to like work on a script. But the famous story goes that her first novel published was actually a, a, a hard boiled crime novel called uh, Nothing Good from a Corpse or I think no, it's No Good from a Corpse. No Good from a Corpse. Right. And um, she uh, the the legend goes that Howard Hawks was about to do the big sleep with Humphrey Bogart and said, get me this Lee Brackett guy on the phone <clears throat> because I, I want him to work on this script for me. And then found out that Lee Brackett was a woman, but still hired Lee Brackett to work on it with, of all people, William Faulkner. Not to mention that she also had Ray Bradbury as her best man at her wedding. So this lady was connected. Um, wow. Cora, what do you think is the most important thing about uh, Lee Brackett's biography before we really get into the book? Mm -hmm. Well, it's difficult to say what's the most important thing. I mean, really, she was um, very connected, yeah, especially to the whole Hollywood scene. It wasn't just a big sleep and the Empire Strikes Back. She wrote a lot of she wrote screenplays for for El Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, now Rio Bravo, El Dorado, Hatari. So she wrote dialogue, not just for for Humphrey Bogart, she wrote dialogue for John Wayne, for Hardy Krueger, who just died. Yes, he was in Hatari, so, and so I thought, and she was, um, and also she was, of course, um, one of the pioneering women of science fiction, and one of the few women, there were more than, more, more than just Lee Brackett and C.L. Moore, but those are the two women of the 1940s we still remember today, today, because uh, most of the other women from that era have sadly been forgotten, forgotten, but we still have um, Lee Brackett and C.L. Moore, and also together with C.L. Moore, Lee Brackett invented this, the character of the space rogue and space outlaw, so uh, of course she did write dialogue for Han Solo, but uh, together with C.L. Moore, she was the person who created this uh, character type, because most space char heroes earlier were more straight-laced uh, characters. Lee Brackett didn't do straight-laced uh, laced nice spaceman Man, <laughs> her characters were always sort of outlaws. We see this. You can also see this in the big jump, of course. Absolutely, and uh, it's funny when you see Lawrence Kasdan get all this credit for 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 the space outlaw. And you're like, hmm, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> well, it seems like well, and I know Lee Brackett was good friends with the Cutner with Cutner and CL Moore as part of when they moved out to Los Angeles and were part of that whole writing community. And um, we talked a lot about that writing community in our Anthony Boucher episode, but Brackett was a part of that writing community um, in L.A., and I don't know if she was as active as the Kuttners were with the Heinlein group, but I know that, you know, part of the reason why she probably had such an easy time publishing so quickly is that she was connected and they all knew how good she was, right? Yeah. It, also, we should maybe mention that she was married to Edmund Hamilton, who is, um, of course, one of the pioneers of the space opera subgenre, because um, he, Edmund Hamilton started writing space operas uh, in the late 20s, a little, a little later than Edward E. Smith, so he's one of the pioneers. And uh, in my opinion, he's of the very early space opera writer. Hamilton is better than Smith. I'm not a huge Smith fan. fan and... Um, he also created Captain Future, which was one of my, which via an anime series from Jap from Japan in the late seventies, which aired on German TV, was one of my early science fiction influences. And because I saw this at age seven, and uh, okay, it was the coolest thing ever. And even, only later I learned that it was based on books, and uh, they were actually written by by Edmund Hamilton, who was married to Lee Brackett. So yes, we should maybe mention him too. If you want to hear Edmund. Hamilton and Lee Brackett were guests of honor at the Baycon in, I think it was 64 or 65, and that is on YouTube, and you can hear Tony Boucher introduce them, and then Lee Brackett gives a speech about how important science fiction was to her life, 
it's not all these people from this era do we even have recordings of their voices. So that is a really cool thing. Yeah, and um, well, one thing that we do want to say is that this book was originally published as an ace double. And so, yeah, we should get into the history of this. Um, and if you're not familiar with what ace doubles were in the 50s, uh, Don Wolheim, who was the lead editor at um, Ace Books, uh, science fiction editor, and if uh, we did, all, we interviewed Don's daughter on this show, so you can go back and listen to that for complete history of that. But Don Wolheim was one of the original Futurians from the the crew of science fiction writers from New York City that included Isaac Asimov, Frederick Paul, Judith Merrill, and. Um, he was the editor of this line, and the way Ace Doubles worked were that you basically had two science fiction novels, do si do, where they're, you know, one would go one way, one would go the other way. Uh, let's see, I have one right he uh, here, which is actually The Edge of Time, which is written by Don Wolheim under the name David Grindel, and the first novel published by John Bruner. <laughs> So you can see how the ace doubles work. Um, I do not have this one on ace double. <laughs> uh, but this particular book, The Big Jump, was the leap rack. They, what they try to do is put an established writer with a less established writer, right? And so Lee Brackett was obviously the big name here because it was the debut of Philip K. Dick. Now, a lot of people knew Philip K. Dick because he was publishing widely in the magazines, and his stories were popular. So I'm sure there were people who were excited that Solar Lottery was coming out. That And Solar Lottery is not exactly the most original of PKD's works. He said he he's clearly admitted that he was trying to be A.E. Von Vogt. He was trying to invoke The World of Melee by A.E. Von Vogt and The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. Now, Grant, you've never read Lee Brackett before. Had you ever heard of Lee Brackett before I asked you? to do this no that's the crazy thing i know who cl moore is i know who cutner is i know basically everyone else everyone's mentioned so far i know who they are and i've read some piece of their work but lee brackett for some reason i've never come across her work i didn't know who she was until you mentioned her on facebook and I had no idea she worked on the empire strikes back i mean i love star wars i've seen all the movies but I haven't done that deep dive into that first draft or, you know, that she did. So, Cora, what's your history with the big jump specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, it wasn't a Lee Brackett book I'd read before simply because, um, I mean, there is, an, is a print edition now, but it's not one of the more popular, more common or frequently reprinted ones. And the Ace Double is actually quite pricey. I think, uh, I found it on Amazon for, it goes like 50 euros, which is a lot for an ace double. Double, so, um, probably also because of the Dick connection. And, um, so this one was a new, new novel for me by a writer I already liked and, uh, liked, which was, of course, always a lovely thing to discover, a new, a new work by a writer you like. Mm -hmm. And I, you have to the, you. I have the ace second oh. edition. Mm -hmm. um, which I managed to find at a local used bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> Mine is a not very, very cool print on demand <laughs> thing from Amazon <laughs> with a stock photo cover, but it does the job. Yeah, it does the job. I, 395, it says on the inside for, that I got it at the used bookstore that didn't understand what a cool thing they had. <laughs> yeah. Hey, benefits. It's a lucky I got find. it for the same price. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, so it's, cool like that um, we all just read this for the first time but and it's a short one it's uh, this edition is 128 pages so real slim so it's funny because when I asked you know when because I put the call out and Graham was the one who responded and uh, I knew you could read it real quick <laughs> yeah yeah it's a short one and that has to do with that the whole ace double thing it's like um, and you could tell it, part of the history of the ace doubles is and, like, another ace double that I have here is uh, John Bruner. This, he has, just like Lee Brackett did several times, these are two John Bruner novels, right? And he, almost all of his ace doubles 
he went back and later restored all like the huge amounts of text that Don Wolheim would cut out to, to get them to the length that he wanted them to be. And so Castaway World, for example, was later published by Don Wolheim's new pub print, uh, DAW, in the 70s under the name Polymath and expanded in almost all of his ace doubles he uh, redid and expanded, right? Which is, is just interesting. But now, now, you were saying before we were recording, Cora, that Lee Brackett had really good luck with, with the ace doubles. Can you talk to us about a little bit about some of those other ace doubles? Because that's pretty cool uh, information, I think, for people, too. Yes, well, she did... Um... I don't know all, but she she had one actually which was similar to the Brunner one. It was a double. It was two Lee Brackett stories, two of the Eric Lund Stark stories, um, titled then um, "People of the Talisman" and uh, and what was the other name? Name. I'm sorry. The original titles the were "Queen of, of the Martian," it's "Martian the Catacombs," and "Black Amazon of Mars." But there were two Eric Lund Stark stories which were a little bit expanded from the originals because there were novellas in the original. So she could actually expand them for the ace double legs. From, from the <laughs> and then she version, had, yeah. yeah. And then she had um, a story called The Sword of Rhea Non, non as an, published as an ace double, which is, I think, also one of the really exp- really pricey and sought after ones. Coupled that's with the, um, Conan that's the, the Conqueror. the first one I ever read. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sword of Rhea Non. It's an excellent story and was coupled with... Um, the Hour of the Dragon or Conan the Conqueror, the only Conan novel by Robert E. Howard, which is, of course, also a fabulous pairing. And yeah. Brackett also was a fan of Howard's, but although they never met because um, he lived in Texas and died well before she was actively writing. Right. Yeah, that's pretty good luck getting uh, thrown in with yeah. the Conan <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, sometimes you have ace doubles where, where really one half is terrible, but uh, but this one, but this one, but she always had had two great no it was always two great novels. Well and one thing I want to do before we start really talking about the plot here is that um, I want to put some context and time here. This was re- the original Big Chump serialization was nineteen fifty three, right? And then the the novel was published in fifty five. So and fifty five is the same year that Rosa Parks um, you know refused to move to the back of the bus, right? And um, just to give context for where we are in the world that this book that has like such like a powerful message at the end, it's very interesting. Um, so, okay. So the plot of the, of the big jump is, is, you know, and at this point, um, this, I think people should, we're going to spoil things. We're going to talk about things. Um, I, I would hope most people would go and read this. It's 128 pages before they get to this point, but this is a good point to stop and, pause and go buy it and read it and come back if you haven't um, because we're we're really going to get into this. I would consider this, and I'm wondering how both of you feel about this, but I actually think this is almost science fiction horror. I think this is like, it's got kind of like a psychological horror thing going on. And, um, you know, so this, the storyline is, and what, what I really think is cool is I love titles that have two meanings, right? And the big jump it's not just this idea that they're taking this big journey and this thing. It's that they're that this changes humanity. Like, it changes these characters' humanity, but it's the idea that Lee Brackett was saying in 1953, if we make this jump, it's going to change everything about who we are. And it can be scary, and are we prepared for this? Do we know? And it's funny because it, it feels to me like it's similar to what Lem was doing with Solaris, but a little bit pulpier. Anyways, that's my first thought on it. Um, Grant, what's your first thought uh, on after having re- read it? Like, first thoughts. Um, it was a fun book. I really enjoyed it. I'm thankful I came across your post because I never would have known she existed. But it was very fun. It's very pulpy. I definitely get what you're saying about sci-fi horror, kind of like they're almost like some zombified characters in the book, for sure. Um, definitely fun. And even like you said, with the time frame this was in, I was kind of taken aback that one of the characters, uh, I don't know how to say her name, Sidna, is definitely a person of color in the book. 
And especially this time, I was very shocked. I was like, did I read this wrong? And then I saw that, you know, that bloodline, they have the Indian and Native American, you know, in there. And I was pretty shocked and pretty impressed. You know, there's a prominent female character, prominent person of color. So, well, one of Lee Brackett's most famous short stories is an anti-racism story that oh. a little on the nose, but it's great. So she she was she was passionate about that issue for sure. Also, um, Eric John Stark, her most famous character, who appeared in three novellas and three novels in the from the late forties to the nineteen nineteen seventies, was a black man. He's oh, uh, wow. he's extra he's described as a very dark. Of course. Uh, it took until the early 20th, 21st century for someone to actually portray him correctly because they always painted someone yeah. white and blonde, blonde, uh, but uh, he is a black man and it's, it's very, very literally described. And she also has another black character, character called uh, Roy Campbell in a wonderful and lesser known story called The Citadel of the Lost Ships, uh, ships. So, um, she was, um, for her time, I'm quite progressive with regards to um, having diverse characters. Mm-hmm. Now, Cora, this, this is your first time reading The Big Jump, and it is very different for a bracket book. Um, but I'm, you probably knew the reputation of it, right? Or um, how was your feelings as a longtime bracketeer, like uh, getting into this one? Well, um, I enjoyed it. It's a um, sort of transitional novel, novel because um, Liebrecht is most famous for stories set in the solar system on a Mar- on Mar- a Mars with ancient ruins, um, habitable Venus, Venus, and so on. Those are the stories she's most famous for. And here we have the same. I call it the pulp science fiction shared solar system because a lot of pulp science fiction was set in this solar system where every planet is habitable and inhabit and inhabited. And, um, but, um, in the, of course, we have to remember this was pre Sputnik. And, uh, so no person, no human being, no, no man made object had been to space yet, let alone human beings. This was pre Gagarin, pre Sputnik. Nick, but of course, uh, they all knew it was coming. Them coming. People were, rockets were already around, uh, around since uh, World War Two, and, um, tests were being made. Everybody knew it was coming. And also, um, Telescopes had become much better that um, it was becoming obvious that the solar system Liebrecht and other writers of the era had described in the 1940s was not viable. Viable. It would, it did not exist. And so, yes, we have a scene set on Mars and on, but the moon, for example, is airless. There are scenes on the moon, but it's airless and they're set under a glass dome. Dome and Mars is um, only very vaguely bes- described. But it's not the ancient ruined mass from the stories which have which appeared only a few years earlier. And so this is clearly is, there transitional. Is a, there is a moment where they talk about how a uh, Valentine's ship would have crashed into Pluto if they hadn't been out on patrol. So um, yes, it's yeah. still it's still inhabited, and Pluto's of course still a planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they don't know of the any the trans-Neptunian other objects. But it's um, but um, and this is also I think this is probably the first bracket where they go beyond the solar system system and um, of course there's still pioneers going beyond the solar system right and, and then after that she transitioned her her main yeah. character the so later ones uh, were set um, no I think the next book to come out would have been the Long Tomorrow which is a dystopian post apocalyptic nuclear war story and then the later ones are the later stories are set um, Further field in um, in uh, on other planets, so outside the solar system. Yeah. He was literally one of the authors who had their who literally had their had their the bottom pulled out under them when uh, when they found out that everything they described was simply not possible. And also, you can of course see her very much. You can see her history as a writer of hardball fiction here because a lot of this is, it is actually a mystery. It's a hardball mystery for a long time. Time, there's a man, the hear the protagonist wants to find his missing friend. There's a mystery what happened to the expedition. And then it takes a sharp turn into horror once they get, get to Barnard Star. Star, and uh, the horror scenes there reminded me very much of a Clark Ashton Smith story, which also has, um, the spill, has a abyss with a spilling ramp and terrible things happening, people being changed. Called, I, I actually, if you look it up, it's called The Dweller in the Gulf. 
It appeared in 1933 three in Wonder Stories, and um, I now wonder whether Brackett has read it. He probably he could have, and actually, since he also lived in California, he might have actually known Smith, though he wasn't active anymore by the six by the 1950s. Well, I mean, and there's horror earlier in the book too, like the scene, the first scene yeah. with Valentine in the bed. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, twitching, the twitching zombie fight with Valentine. Yeah, I have the quote here. It's the thing that lay in the bed between the barred sides was Valentine. It was Valentine. It was dead, quite dead. There was no covering on it to hide its deadness. No, no breathing lifted the flattened ribs. No pulse beat anywhere. The pale transparent of uh, anywhere beneath the pale transparent skin, and the tracery of veins was dark. The face was dead, and yet it moved. I thought that was great. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and the thing is, is it's as pulpy as it is. There are moments of really excellent prose here, uh, and some of the descriptions of uh, how thin. I loved some of the descriptions of how thin the spaceship was. Uh, the the scene where they're playing cards. And she's talking about how absurd it is that they have just this little thing between them and the vastness of the crazy universe, and they're playing cards. I yeah. thought that was great. That was one of my favorite moments of world building in there. I love that she refers to it as not space <laughs> when they're uh, time jumping. It's fucking great. I uh, love that. And uh, the description of New York City. Um, and I, I have that. Um, well, I want to talk about this. This description of New York City when, 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 uh, uh, Common gets there. Uh, the big jump had been made. Man had finally reached the stars. Every clerk and shop girl, every housewife, businessman, and bum, that was funny, felt a personal hysteria of pride and achievement. They swayed in dense masses across Times Square, feeling big with a sense of history, sensing the opening drum beats of an uh, epic in a way in what they saw and heard from the news service screens. I thought that was great. Uh, we're all building. Um, what do you guys think about the world building in this book? Because I think that the, the that she very subtly created this world. Uh, Grant, first you. I mean, I thought it was great. It was very well done. The prose, especially the descriptions, the very. It wasn't bloated or overdone. Definitely nice paragraph establishing some rocks on a planet. But very well done. I was impressed reading it. I wasn't bored. And I was even surprised by the blurbs on the back of the book where they just sort of call it, what is it, good writing and good characterization. It's not an over-the-top tour de force or phenomenal. It's just sort of like, hey, this is a good book and this is good writing and good prose. But I felt like they kind of didn't give her her just due and her credit because she does a great job with the descriptions and the minimalistic way of just being direct and straight to the point. But I thought it was great. I mean, there's so many different scenes being established in this book and in such a short amount of pages. Yeah. Yeah. Cora, as far as you're concerned as a longtime bracket reader, what do you think? How do you think this ranks as a piece of her writing? Um, well, I mean, Lee Brackett is always good, and um, she's um, she also was good even from the very first few stories on. And uh, this, uh, of course, shows again what a really great writer she was, and how easily she could establish uh, an atmosphere here with only a few descriptions. I mean, prose-wise, Brackett was um, was one of the one of the top writers of the of the pulp era of the 1940s. 40s. She's uh, she's well, she's uh, She's prose-wise leagues above people like Asimov or Heinlein. Asimov, of course, wasn't very. He had he had great ideas. He wasn't very good stylistically. In many ways, he's also. Um, in some ways, I think he's also also better than style prose-wise and atmosphere-wise than some of the early dicks, which are also a little bit uh, with great ideas, but uh, written it's a little bit like like oh, it's fifty, it's nineteen fifties galactic suburbia. Of course, I mean. You do now notice that it is that this is an older book. You have people smoking in space and that sort of thing. And um, the description of New York City is wonderful, but it's obviously the New York City of the 1950s. It's a uh, you can I mean 
when I read it, I imagined a scene like from Mad Men with uh, Don Draper walking along Times Square. And yeah. it looks like, of course, yeah, it reminds me of old movies you see of, of Times Square. It's not the Times Square of today, today, but, um, Most but it's very, very atmospheric. And, uh, she was one of, she was one of the, she was, atmosphere was one of her great strengths. And her other great strengths was, of course, uh, dialogue and characterization. I mean, she was a screenwriter and an excellent screenwriter. Right. She wrote dialogue for some of the best, uh, best actors in, at the, of the time. Also, um, she said about Humphrey Bogart, for whom she wrote uh, dialogue in The Big Sleep. She said, Humphrey Bogart usually changed the dialogue. He didn't care. He always changed the script, but what he, d he did was always better. And she learned a lot from him. That's something she, she said in an interview years later. Yeah, one of the few things that, that made me go, oh, this is the 50s, was there's a scene where there was a fight and he said, and he said, listen, Buster, <laughs> that kind of cracked me up. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Buster, um, you maybe. can't, you, you wouldn't go wrong if you imagined almost every bracket character who's not explicitly, who's not Eric John Stark, John Stark uh, as uh, played by Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, what's funny too is like with Dick, reading a lot of PKD as I do for the podcast, like Dick doesn't worry about like being in the future. <laughs> for example, like Skin or Darkly, it's very obviously about the 60s. And if it wasn't for the two pieces of technology that separate it, or, you know, the drug, the made up drug, and then the thing, he doesn't care. And what's funny is that this led to him pulling um, Martian time slip from, from Ace because Wolheim they had a very famous argument where, where Wilhelm said that Martian time slip, Dick had it set in 1994, and Wilhelm said, there's no way we'll have Mars colonies by then. You have to set it 100 years in the future. And Dick actually pulled the book from Ace because he's like, that's what he wanted. It. Now, for Dick, that was because he's a surrealist more than an actual science fiction writer, and he doesn't care about like being right. But I think with Brackett here... She's doing pretty good for the time. Like, yeah, she is. Uh, it's real science. I mean, the the, tr the transuranic elements, which are really important to the plot. Plot. They were just because I had to actually had to look this up up uh, because um, I knew we had trans. I knew what transuranic elements were from chemistry class and um, in high school, and it was my focus subject. And um, I also and I knew that there had been transuranic elements, but by nineteen. 55, they were only up to element 100, Mendelevio. And, um, by 1953, when she actually wrote it, they were, they were one element meant short, so it was 99 elements. Now we're up to 190 transuranics. And, um, they didn't discover the transuranics until they had achieved nuclear, fi nuclear fission. Because when you have nuclear fission, you suddenly have, uh, have unwanted plutonium and americium. And I knew they were, so it was really, this was new science at the time. And of course, um, they didn't, they knew what radiation did and that radiation killed. I mean, um, Hiroshima had happened and they also, the first radiation accidents had happened already at the time. People had been killed by radiation. And I mean, the radium girls happened in 19, I think it was 1917 or 1920. So the radium girls, so people already knew radiation could be deadly. We had the transuranics. Um, we, we didn't, of course, <laughs> then she goes off uh, on a tangent, which sort of, as we know, wouldn't happen these days. But, um, but okay, it was, let's say it was for the time, it was a reasonable scientific, um, scientific extrapolation from actual science. Yeah, I don't think you could call it hard science fiction, but I think... She doesn't write hard science fiction, but it, but she does, there older. is actual science yeah. in those stories. Yeah. Also, her earlier stories about the solar system, there's actual science, for example, of the, the tidally locked Mercury with one, one permanently hot and one permanently dark side and the twilight belt. People actually did believe Mercury was like that. Of course, we know now it's not. Right. But, um, but her stories were, for the time, reasonably scientific. They were not, uh, hard. and of course, a lot of hard science from the same, peri same, same period, a lot of hard science fiction is, also complete nonsense, Please, simply yeah. because we, we know the world doesn't work. We, science has overtook uh, science fiction in this case, but, um, but he also didn't let the science get in the way of a good story, which is a problem with a lot of people who wrote for John W. Campbell's Astounding. Yeah. And what's really cool is at the end, you have this whole, um, 
once the transformation starts happening, there's the scene where the character talks about how humanity has kind of always been driven by doing things for food, for shelter, for these things, and then basically suggesting the idea that by going into space, you're you're ju- you that there's an exact quote is you have developed beyond civilization that um, it's a really forward thinking concept in a science fiction novel of, in the fifties to have this idea that we're going to go to space and we're going to become we're going to evolve past this other thing and it's going to be horrifying and hard for the people in between to to make sense of it right. And um, I think it's just a really cool concept for, for 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 the era, and it makes a really interesting book to be dozy do with a book about you know reality TV and psychic cops and random of uh, presidential elections. It just makes a really interesting combo for I'm sure the readers in 1955 were you know thought this was pretty fucking cool, uh, but. Grant, I know we're going to be losing you here real soon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I maybe give... Um, uh, tell me what your... How do, you, how do you feel about, like, overall, like, you know, this first experience reading Bracket, and, 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 you know, what do you think it says to you about this writer? How do you feel like you're going to be moving... Are you going to read more Bracket going forward? Or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like bracket should be a bigger name i mean just based off this one book i've read it's definitely good it's pulpy it's easy to read um very immersive i didn't feel like you know there's a lot that happens in my house on a daily and just busy and it's easy to get distracted from a book but her prose her storytelling the plot the narrative just great i mean i definitely i mean i don't want to hear from both of you what i should read next from bracket because i definitely think it's a fun science fiction novella so yeah Corey, do you want to take that first um well um if you can find it i would uh, would get the Gollum's fantasy masterworks edition called sea kings of mars which is a sort of best of lee bracket ed- collection but unfortunately it's it's fairly recent but it's out of print and apparently quite pricey and um uh, Otherwise, I would also, I would read the three Eric John Stark novellas from the 19, from the late 40s, early 50s. Those are pretty much the top bracket, bracket. Okay. Uh, and, um, the, she also wrote three short novels about the character from the 1970s, which are still good. Not quite as good because, um, some kind of right wing brain eater had gotten to her by them and suddenly you have the, and she's and basically suddenly Eric John Stark has gone to fighting the evil space welfare state and evil space hippies, which is a bit, which was a little bit irony, even when I first read the, read those books in the, what was the late eighties, ni- early nineties, nineties, but they're still, it's still top bracket. Then, of course, there's, um, the, the Long Tomorrow is a bit, is still in print. It's her post apocalyptic novel. It's very good. It's a bit un- good. uncommon. Yeah. And, um, sort of, don't know, it's, Not no, really it's still like in print. Sort of Ria Non is of, is also excellent. It's a bit like, sort of Indiana Jones type, type story, story set on ancient Mars. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. yeah cool. I would you. definitely go with, uh, with the 40s, um, Stark novels. Those are really, really, really good. I know in my tour article I talked about how I would love to see a TV series that was kind of Firefly-ish based on those that were kind of like half sci-fi, half pulpy western, just incredible. Yeah, I would love to see an Eric John Stark TV series. Yeah. And please cast a black actor to play him. Don't do what the, what the many, many cover artists did. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be really phenomenal. And I, I do think that's a good place to go. Um it's funny, I, in a lot of ways, this is my favorite bracket that I've read. Um, I, I think The Long Tomorrow is a better book, but I let this one, t- like, t- uh, touched a lot, uh, you know, punched a lot of my buttons, right? Because it's got the horror, it's got the sci-fi, it's got the, the big message, um, and, and, it, and it wraps it all together with, like, great prose and excellent world building. I think the world building in here is textbook. And you could teach it, um, specifically because of how, what, and what Grant said about how subtle and not overwritten any of it is. It's very, that maybe, you know, a symptom of the fact that it was written for magazines, 
right, for serialization in magazines and then ace doubles. And that's why they could f the ace doubles could feed off that is because a lot of these works started serial. Even Dune was serialized originally in a magazine. So, um, but yeah, it, it's it's really cool. And the fact that it was Josie Doe with Solar Lottery is just kind of neat. So, um, but anyways, I know I wanted to keep this short, so <laughs> I, I got to get Grant out of here. Grant, right, um, yeah, I gotta go. How can people find you? And then I'll do an outro with with. I right, appreciate it. Um, basically, I'm on all social media. If you just Google Grant Wamack, W A M A C K, I'm on Amazon. You can find my books there. Um, Twitter, IG, I'm uh, uh, Grant Mirage, M I R A G E. And uh, yeah, pick up God's Leftovers later this year. Very proud of it. Very excited. So. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you were here, Grant, because I wanted to get somebody who had never read Bracket at all. Oh, it was a pleasure. Very educational. So. <laughs> well, nice fun. meeting you, Grant. Nice and meeting of course, you I'm always happy to introduce people to Lee Bracket. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Appreciate it. All right, Cora. Um, uh, Cora, how can people find your work? And, um, and then uh, any last thoughts on Lee Bracket with Big John? Well, um, you can find me on the web at www.corabulat.com, C-O-R-A-B-U-H-L-E-R-T. And um, you can also find my books on Amazon, of course, also linked at my website. And you can find me on Twitter under Cora Bulat, again, C-O-R-A-B-U-H-L-E-R-T. And, um, well, about Libre... Um, I'm really glad I read this book because it's a great, if lesser known, Lee Brackett book. And I'm surprised that it is so little known among her books because it's a really, really good one. It's a way up, it's up there with The Long Tomorrow and the, the Stark story. So it really deserves to be better known. And I'm not, not quite sure why it isn't. Maybe because her uh, 50s work is not quite as well known as her 40s work. Do you think that's because of how short it is? I mean, I think it might be the yes, it might be the length that said it's difficult. It's a little bit too short to uh, it's a it's a it's, it's a little kind of short. It's a, it's, it's a it's a hard it's a difficult length to reprint. It's too long to put it in a collection, but it's too short for a standalone at least until print on demand and so on. Especially since nowadays uh, books all have to be very 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 big. So maybe that's why it's um, a little bit too forgotten. And, yeah, um, I mean, I love the Long Tomorrow, but I I think this is like I said, this is my favorite bracket I've read. Yeah, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful book, and I'm really surprised that it's not better known. I'd expected it would be a bit of a lesser one, like um, No Shadow of a Mars is actually is excellent, and the one retro Hugo highly deserved, but it's weaker than some of the than sort of Rionon or the Stark stories are. Uh, but um, I thought it would also be a lesser one like Alpha Centauri or Die and so on, which are is, uh, which is still good, but not quite as good as some of the others. But it's really it's top tier bracket, and uh, I wish more people would read it, especially since there is an affordable print and ebook edition out. Okay, it's got an ugly cover, but uh, <laughs> as far as I would say, my last thoughts on on bracket is that it's really, really, really sad that. If you Google Lee Bracket or if you look up Lee Bracket, 98% of it is Empire Strikes Back. And, uh, yeah, she did great work on Empire Strikes Back. She was very important to it. And I guess I'm glad that that at least there's that. I mean, some authors, you know, don't have that, right? Um, but she did so much more work over the years. Uh, and it's just kind of sad to see it just come down to... Yeah. Actually, if you are a Star Wars fan, fan, and like the Empire Strikes Back or the original trilogy, and even if you like the, like the Mandalorian and everything, you really owe it to yourself to read Bracket because, uh, because a lot of the, uh, because a lot of the ideas uh, came from there. And the story goes that George Lucas called up Lee Bracket because he loved her science fiction stories from the 1940s, which he'd read. And uh, he called her up and said, um, if she would want to, she wanted to be a street to, writes a screenplay for The Empire Strikes Back, and then he asked, like, do you have any screenplay experience? And she said, like, um, I wrote The Big Sleep and El Dorado and Rio Bravo and everything, and thing. And she said, like, wait a minute, you're that Lee Bracket? You're the same person? Because he didn't know. She was like, why did you call me up then? And she said, like, well, I like your science fiction stories from the 1940s. 
Right, right. So yes, a lot of the ideas actually, um, I think even Dune, because as we mentioned it, the sandworms from Dune show up in the Lee Brackett story. I think it's Shadow Over Mars. Yes, it's Shadows Over Mars from 1944. Yeah. And he does seem to be getting more of a deal right at the moment because we are rediscovering uh, forgotten marginalized writers and women writers, writers, which is a good thing because, um, about 20 years ago, it was very difficult to find any Lee Brackett in print at all. So I'm glad that her stuff is available again. Also, if you don't, you can also find a lot of 1940s science fiction, fiction magazines on the inter, on the internet archive, including original Brackett stories. If you don't, if you don't want to pay for them, but um, you should really pay for them. <laughs> I think they're really, they're worth it. They're worth paying for. Yeah. For and uh, I'm glad that she's being rediscovered. Also glad that she finally got her. She never got a Hugo in her lifetime. She was nominated for the Long Tomorrow, but she never won a Hugo in her lifetime. She won a posthumous one for the Empire Strikes Back because unfortunately she died um, before the movie was completed. Yeah. Completed. She died in 1979 of cancer. She was sadly she died. She didn't. I think she was only um, 64. At any rate, she did. She did not grow very old. Sadly. So yeah, we lost her very early, is, which is a great that, pity. Yeah, and well, uh, I think she shares with Dick because he died. Yeah, of course. We also lost Philip K. Dick way too early, and he also, at least he got to see several of her screenplays made into movies. Dick didn't even get to see Blade Runner, which is a terrible pity, I think. Yeah, he saw the first 20 minutes, and that's it. Okay, at least he saw that, but um, still, it's uh, Dick is always a tragedy he likes. So much of his stuff has been adapted, and... Uh, his daughters at least get the, mo get the money and the, the royalties, but he never really profited from his fame, which is also a huge tragedy. Yeah. And I'm really glad that he finally got two, two retro Hugos in, uh, nine, from the 1945 retro. So in, two, so in 2020, she won two retro Hugos for Shadow Over Mars for best novel and the best related work for an essay about the science fiction writing field from the, from the, in the 1940s. Ooh, I need to read that. I haven't read that. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating essay. It's uh, not all that easy to find. It's a, uh, but uh, there's a, it's um, been collected in a, I think it's actually was a program book of a pulp convention. But at any rate, it's, uh, it's available in the collection because it was in a writing magazine. So no one scans uh, or collects those. So, so it's not, but it's a fascinating essay about, um, about the different magazines in the field with a nice, uh, so it was a nice lab at John W. Campbell, with whom she, with whom she and Edmund Hamilton famously didn't get along. They didn't like him, which is why she almost, which was, is why she had almost nothing published in Downing. She didn't get along with Campbell. Yeah, well, well, a lot of people didn't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think Dick though. probably also didn't. He wasn't. I, I don't recall reading any Dick. I don't recall really seeing any Dick in Analog or Astounding. No, no. He, he was also wasn't a Campbellian, Campbellian writer at all. No, he was not a Campbellian. And for, for one thing, like, he had, I mean, he literally lived in walking distance to Boucher's house, and Boucher is the one who published it. Yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, Cora, your, your uh, knowledge of the genre is awesome. I love it. Um, I'm sure I'll have to figure out a way to get you back on. We're going to have to talk to you more or somebody. Uh, yeah, at, at I'm always um, I'm always up for talking about science fiction. <laughs> yeah, or fantasy. yeah. Uh, well, we're getting into we're getting to the late part of his life here. So, uh, but we still love to do all the Dick Jason stuff. And this this uh, you can't get more adjacent than sharing the binding. And uh, yeah, so it's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm really excited. I didn't know that you hadn't read this one before. So. No, um, it was uh, it was really it was one of I think it's it's one of only I haven't it's one of only um, two brackets I haven't read and I haven't read the the, the no good from a corpse which I think is also out of print print but um, of her science fiction it's only two I haven't read and this was one of them. Well, I'm thinking I'm, I need to re see I need to see the big sleep again. I might be going down a sleep mm. bracket movie. Yeah, it's uh, the big sleep is. Uh, I mean, it's always worth watching, and uh, especially uh, um, I can you can really imagine every every pretty much every character Lee Brackett ever wrote being played by Humphrey Bogart, unless it's Eric John Stark, because Humphrey Bogart sort of has the wrong the wrong the wrong skin color for that. But everybody else you can imagine imagine played by Humphrey Bogart, and yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I would make a wonderful. All right, uh, Cora, thank you for joining us on Dickheads, and yeah. um, I hope people will find your work. You do excellent fan writing stuff. Uh, let's uh, hope this year we go from nomination to winner with Hugo. You definitely yeah, do. we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Nominations are open. Are... Let's we'll see. I finished uh, finished in second place twice. Of course, it would be nice to eventually finish in first place and actually get a rocket and not just a pin. Hey, just for the amount of knowledge you have, you deserve a Hugo, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, it's awesome. Uh, I love I love finding other people who know as much of this nerdy stuff as I do. Um, yeah. And. Uh, it's always good to connect. So uh, you have a nice evening in Germany, and we'll... Uh, yeah, we'll thanks for having me. All right, thanks.